welcome. In this video, we're going to be revising the climate change topic for higher geography. We'll be looking at the physical and human causes of climate change, some of the local and global effects that climate change is having around the world, and some possible management strategies and their limitations. So we'll start by looking at physical causes of climate change, beginning with Milankovitch cycles, which are the collective effects of changes in Earth's orbit on its climate. There are three elements to Milankovitch cycles. They are changes in Earth's eccentricity, tilt and precession, or as they're also termed, stretch, tilt and wobble of Earth's orbit. In terms of eccentricity, Earth's orbit stretches from circular to elliptical over 96,000 to 136,000 years. In a circular orbit, the distance from the Sun is the same all year round, so the amount of energy received stays roughly constant. But when the orbit is stretched, Earth is closer to the Sun in some phases of its orbit, but further in others, and seasonal variations become more extreme. In terms of the tilt of Earth's axis, this varies from 22.3 degrees to 24.5 degrees over a 41,000 year cycle. A greater tilt means more sunlight in polar regions, which can lead to accelerated melting. And in terms of the precession, the Earth wobbles on its axis like a spinning top over a 19,000 to 23,000 year cycle, which slowly changes the timing of the seasons. If Earth is closest to the Sun in summer and further in winter, this results in more extreme heat and cold. But if Earth is further from the Sun in summer and closer in winter, the difference between the seasons is reduced. Another physical factor is sunspots. The number of these darker patches on the surface of the sun varies on an 11 year cycle, with more sunspots leading to higher temperatures. A third physical factor that can cause climate change is volcanic eruptions. Particularly violent eruptions can produce large amounts of aerosols or dust particles which enter Earth's atmosphere causing solar radiation to be blocked out and reflected back into space, as happened after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Within two hours of this eruption, a dust cloud 35 kilometers high and 400 kilometers wide had been produced. Over the next two years, this led to a fall in global temperatures by an average of 0.5 degrees. The fourth and final one of the physical factors that I'm going to talk about is melting ice caps. Melting ice caps can lead to large amounts of fresh water being released into Earth's oceans, which can affect ocean circulation patterns, as was explained in the hydrosphere video. In the North Atlantic, this could change the North Atlantic drift, causing it to weaken significantly and leading to colder winters in North and Western Europe. It is important to state that these natural causes of climate change do not explain the current warming trend we have seen in the climate over the past century. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change makes very clear that 100% of this current warming trend is explained by human emissions of greenhouse gases. So I am now going to talk about these. Next we're going to discuss the human causes of climate change. Some of them are listed here on the screen, but it's not just enough in an exam answer to list these causes. You need to be able to explain why they cause climate change supporting your answer with facts and figures as far as possible in order to strengthen your response. Burning fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas, to power factories, generate electricity and power stations and to heat homes, releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which will trap heat. 80% of world energy comes from fossil fuels, which are responsible for 35 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. Increased car ownership has resulted in more petrol and diesel being used to fuel cars, which leads to increased carbon dioxide emissions, with car ownership predicted to increase 60% by 2070. Cement manufacturing is responsible for 5% of carbon dioxide emissions. To make cement, limestone is heated to high temperatures and breaks down to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. On top of this, the energy required to produce a tonne of cement generates one tonne of CO2. Deforestation, especially in the Amazon rainforest, has resulted in less carbon dioxide being absorbed by trees. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Amazon absorbed about 2 billion tonnes per year. Now, this is down to 1 to 1.2 billion tonnes. 
Methane is released from landfill sites as waste decomposes and when drilling for natural gas. The increase in paddy fields to feed rapidly growing populations in Asian countries has also increased the amount of methane in the atmosphere and the increasing demand for beef has resulted in more methane being created by belching cattle and from animal dung. Methane can result in over 80 times more heating than carbon dioxide by 2040, but it only stays in the atmosphere for around 12 years, whereas CO2 can stay there for up to 200 years. As permafrost melts within the Arctic tundra, frozen organic matter is decaying, and methane and carbon dioxide, which have been stored for thousands of years, are being released, adding to the rate of global warming. Nitrous oxide could result in over 200 times more heating than carbon dioxide by 2040 and can stay in the atmosphere for over a century. It is being released from car exhaust emissions and power stations. Due to rising food demand, the increased production of fertilisers also adds to the amount of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. Finally, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, could result in 7,000 times more heating than carbon dioxide by 2040 and they can stay in the atmosphere for over 40 years. They're released from disused refrigerators when the foam insulation inside them is shredded. The coolants used in fridges and air conditioning systems create CFCs which are safe in a closed system but can be released if appliances are not disposed of correctly. Next we're going to look at some of the local and global impacts that climate change is having and will continue to have around the world starting with the local impacts of climate change, as we might see here in Scotland. As summer temperatures increase, droughts might become more frequent and more severe, causing problems with water quality and supply. Summer temperatures could increase by one to three degrees, which could lead to an increase in heat-related deaths, especially amongst young children and older people and those with underlying medical conditions. Altered rainfall patterns could also bring more heavy downpours, and an increased flood risk, with a 25 to 40% increase in the west of Scotland, which could impact on housing, businesses and infrastructure, especially in insurance costs. Varying water availability will affect hydroelectric power schemes, reducing Scotland's capacity to generate weather-dependent renewable energy. Warmer, wetter weather could increase problems with rot, especially in older houses, while flooding from sewers could spread disease. Also, Rising temperatures could reduce the number of snow days, affecting the ski industry. Meanwhile, sea level rise is already having an impact on parts of Scotland's coast, with increased coastal flooding, erosion and coastline retreat. A rise of over 40 centimetres in the next 50 years would mean raising or strengthening sea walls, abandoning low-lying land and more regular damage to coastal road and rail systems. Climate change may affect the delicate balance of Scotland's ecosystems. Some distinctive Scottish species may struggle and could be lost, while invasive non-native species may thrive. This might also allow existing pests and disease to become established in Scotland. There is a species of mosquito, Anopheles atroparvus, that can transmit the plasmodium parasite that causes malaria which could re-establish itself in Britain, particularly in low-lying coastal areas around the Firth of Forth. Soils may be altered by changes to rainfall patterns and increased temperatures, reducing their ability to support agriculture and forestry, regulate the water cycle and store carbon. However, a warming climate has the potential to improve growing conditions in Scotland. Plant growth needs temperatures on average above six degrees centigrade, so a rise in temperatures could increase the productivity of our agriculture and forestry with double crops of soft fruits. Also, a warming climate may provide more opportunity to be outdoors and enjoy a healthy and active lifestyle, although increasing temperatures could adversely affect people as well, with an increase in skin cancers. These positive impacts are seen to be marginal at best and are far outweighed by the very significant, likely negative impacts many of which are already being seen in different parts of the world. So next we're going to move to look at the global impacts of climate change. Rising sea levels of anything up to 3.6 metres could result from the thermal expansion of the world's oceans as a result of rising temperatures, as well as from the melting of ice caps in places like Greenland and Antarctica. 
This could lead to the flooding of low-lying areas like, for example, Bangladesh, which could lead to large-scale displacement of people, loss of farmland, and also widespread destruction of property. There is likely to be more extreme and more variable weather, with floods, droughts, hurricanes, and tornadoes becoming more frequent and intense. Globally, an increase in precipitation is expected, particularly in the winter in northern countries such as Scotland. However, some areas, like the Great Plains of the USA, may experience drier conditions, and there might be an increased risk of forest fires, for example, in Australia and in California, due to changes in surface temperatures and rainfall patterns. This could lead to an increase in the extent of tropical diseases like yellow fever as warmer areas expand, with possibly up to 40 million more in Africa being exposed at the risk of contracting malaria. There might also be changes to ocean current circulation, with the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic losing its impact on northwestern Europe, resulting in considerably colder winters. There'll be impacts on wildlife, with extinctions of at least 10% of land species and coral reefs suffering 80% bleaching. However, longer growing seasons in many areas in northern Europe will increase food production and the range of crops being grown. Finally, we're going to look at some management strategies that can be used to reduce the effects of climate change. In your exam, you could be asked to explain some of these strategies or to evaluate their effectiveness or otherwise. So I'm going to attempt to cover both. The first of the strategies is reduce, reuse and recycle, which encourages people to try and cut down on the amount of waste that's being sent to landfill sites. This in turn will reduce the amount of methane emissions from decomposing waste. In Scotland, the amount of waste being received at landfill sites has fallen by 57% since 2005. However, the amount of waste being incinerated instead has increased by nearly 200% since 2011. To reduce the amount of carbon dioxide generated by the burning of fossil fuels, households could reduce energy consumption by insulating their homes or switching lights off. Scottish Government data shows that domestic electricity use has fallen by 22% since 2005, suggesting that these strategies are proving effective. Meanwhile, the Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland, or HEAPS, has saved over 400,000 tonnes of CO2 by improving energy efficiency, for example by installing solid wall insulation. People could also be encouraged to use public transport, walk or cycle, or use hybrid or electric cars to cut down on fossil fuel consumption, with Scotland having set a target to reduce all car usage by 20% by 2030. Registration of new electric cars increased by 46% in 2018, compared to 33% across the rest of the UK. The impact of climate change could also be managed by preparing for extreme weather events, for example, flood defences could be built to hold back flood water, or flood plains and natural wetlands could be used to store flood water. The Thames Barrier has successfully protected London from flooding on numerous occasions, and is predicted to provide protection from 1 in 1,000 year flood events. However, a second barrier may be needed to cope with flooding beyond 2070, and advanced warning systems need to be further developed to advise householders of the potential risks of flooding. To manage the effects of drought during periods of low rainfall, the UK government has also implemented hose pipe bans, but these are unpopular and difficult to enforce. London has also built a desalinisation plant at a cost of £250 million, which can provide water to 400,000 households per day, but is only intended to be used during periods of extreme drought due to its high operational costs. You might also be asked, to explain and evaluate the effectiveness of management strategies to reduce climate change at the global scale. In 2015, the COP21 Paris Agreement between developed and developing countries committed them all to limiting climate change to a less than two degrees increase. The European Union wanted to go further than this, committing to a 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to 1990. However, current global policies will actually lead to an increase of between 2.7 and 3.1 degrees.
Under the COP3 Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and the COP18 Doha Amendment in 2012, countries are given limits on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions they are allowed per year. Countries that reach that limit can then buy spare permits from other countries that have produced less than their quota. Although critics argue that more developed countries will simply use carbon trading as an alternative to actually reducing emissions. Solar radiation management aims to increase the Earth's albedo and reflect more sunlight back into space by, for example, releasing aerosols into the stratosphere. 11,800 tonnes of sulphate aerosols would completely offset a doubling of carbon emissions. However, aerosols do not remain in the atmosphere for long, so the process would have to be carried out repeatedly. Carbon dioxide removal is another geoengineering process in which CO2 is captured and injected into cracks in rocks for storage deep underground. While this might be effective in theory, there is a risk that crust movements might fracture the storage zone and increase the risk of leakage while not actually reducing carbon emissions. Finally, renewable energy sources, wind, solar, hydroelectric and geothermal energy, are all green in that they don't release greenhouse gases, but they could be argued to be partially ineffective in that they have high construction costs in comparison to non-renewable energy infrastructure that is already online, and they can cause local land use conflict due to the building of large-scale wind or solar farms or the flooding of land behind new dams. Finally, here's a selection of exam questions from previous years. As you can see, there's a mix of questions about the physical and human factors that can cause climate change, the impacts of climate change, and some questions about strategies to manage climate change, whether it's explaining how they work or evaluating their effectiveness. In all cases, the key to answering questions on climate change is to include specific relevant detail, trying to support your answer with facts and figures wherever possible.